Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I want to tell you a story. This story is not from my sabbatical. This happened maybe four or five or even six years ago. I can't remember exactly. But David and I were spending Shabbat in Montreal. Before heading to Toronto, I was scheduled to give a couple of big talks to a group of Jews who, it turned out, would find none of my jokes funny <laughs> and would think when I told them that we were living in a time of moral crisis and we were dangerously hovering on the precipice of civil war that I'm an alarmist. And it turned out that they were wrong on both fronts. My jokes were very funny. And we were also, it turns out, heading exactly in the direction I thought we were and dangerously closer to disaster than any of them or any of us really even wanted to admit. But we didn't know any of that yet. And David and I were going to spend a sweet Shabbat in Montreal. And we found a hotel that had a plant-based menu. And that's really important because um, for those who've never traveled Shomer Shabbat, as Shabbat observers to a place where you don't know anybody, the hotel restaurant is extremely critical. Um, this place had, had great food and, and that was perfect. The only problem was that we checked in and then Shabbat started and we got a note under the door that, uh, that alerted us to the fact that the restaurant was going to be closed all day on Saturday because they were prepping for a wedding or something. And so uh, we were stuck. We were stuck in a city where we didn't know anybody uh, without any plans for food all day on Saturday and unable to spend money to go out and buy it because Shabbat had already started. Now, thankfully, David, uh, my husband who derives... I would say tremendous anticipatory joy from looking up the best vegan restaurants in cities uh, that we are going to, had already made reservations for Motzei Shabbat, for after Shabbos, to the best vegan restaurant in the whole city, which was just a short walk away from our hotel. You know where I'm going. So we basically fasted all of Shabbat. I ate an apple. <laughs> We walked the city, we sat on the waterfront, we climbed the watchtower, we stared longingly at people who were eating poutine with reckless abandon. We spent the day dreaming of the big feast that we would have once Shabbat ended. We awaited those three stars in the sky that would glimmer at us, a signal of the end of Shabbat. And as the sun was setting, we got all dressed up. I put on high heels. That is a rare occasion. We made Havdalah, and we walked over to the restaurant. And just as we were seated, I turned on my phone, and it vibrated with a message from Melissa saying, Happy Tisha B'Av. <laughs> my God, I thought, is it Tisha B'Av? I thought that was tomorrow night. How could I have gotten the dates wrong? I furiously checked my calendar. She must be punking me. But no, Melissa was right. I looked at David, and David looked at me. We were 3,000 miles away from home. Do you understand what I'm saying? Nobody in Montreal knows me. Nobody knows David, and we knew nobody. And it's in moments like this that you really have to ask yourself, what really is all of this for? Tonight begins Tisha B'Av, where our practice is to sit on the ground, to read Eicha, the Book of Lamentations, Eicha Yoshbav Adad, Ha'ir Abatiyam Ha'ita Ke'almana. Alas, the, the lonely city, once great with people, that was great among nations, now like a widow. Zion's roads are in mourning. Her gates are empty. Her infants are in captivity. Her inhabitants are searching for bread. Al-Ela ani bochia. For these things do I weep. Listen for a minute to the words of the prayer that we're called to say tomorrow in the afternoon of Tisha B'Av. Adonai, we say, God, console the mourners of Zion, the mourners of Jerusalem. The city is in ruins, despised and desolate. 
bereft of her children, ruined of her dwellings, despised in contrast to her former glory, desolate, no inhabitants. She sits alone with her head covered like a barren woman. You get the picture? God has forsaken us, bitterly raged against us, and so we weep. And we reiterate the dream that one day the streets of Jerusalem will again be filled with the laughter of children and the joy of bridegroom and bride. But here's the problem, of course. Already 15 years ago, we celebrated my brother's wedding in a hotel garden in Jerusalem overlooking the old city, and we danced all night long. And I'm thinking about, and I've talked many times about, the shook in Jerusalem. When the fruit stands recede and the bars and the musicians take their place and, and it's packed with people young and old, Ashkenazi, Mizrahi, Ethiopian, American. Just two months ago when my daughter Eva was in Jerusalem, she sent us videos of, of singing and dancing in the streets. So reading these words as we will tonight, these words of lamentation, this liturgy, the most striking realization first and foremost has to be that Jerusalem has been rebuilt, right? I heard Yossi Klein Halevi reflect that on the first Tisha B'Av after the six-day war in 1967, he sat down and ate a falafel because he realized that the dream of returning to Jerusalem had been fulfilled. Of course, there's, there's one caveat here, which is that some people really dream of a rebuilt Beit HaMikdash, a rebuilt temple. I do not share that dream. We understand that the spiritual and religious life that we've built in place of those temple rites are more meaningful, more personal, more accessible, more humane. I, and I imagine many of us, have absolutely no desire to return to temple times, notwithstanding the self-aggrandizing theatrics of some low-grade conservative American Jewish pundits over the course of the last couple of weeks. And so some people will say, well, we're tr you don't know who I'm talking about? Save yourselves. You don't need to know. He doesn't deserve your time. <laughs> some traditionalists will say, we do this because this is just what Jews do. It doesn't matter that it, it, the messaging is a little off in our time. But pragmatists among us will say, this makes no sense. It makes no sense to mark this day anymore as we have, so let's move on. And what's more, the faithful will join the pragmatists in saying, it's actually insulting to God to mark this day as we did for 2,000 years. It's insulting to God after the miracle of the revitalization of the, of the Jewish people and the state of Israel out of the ashes of the Shoah, the Holocaust. And even more problematic, I want to ask us to consider, does not the repetitive, intensive grieving for the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem, the ceaseless naming of our oppressors and all of these historic wrongs, does that not imprint on our hearts a sense of eternal victimhood that not only fails to accurately reflect the wonder and the miracle of Jew Jewish perseverance and resiliency throughout history, but also distorts our self-perception, leaving us feeling aggressively defensive. When I was in seminary, the chancellor was a scholar named Ismar Shorsh, who warned many years ago that the creation of the state of Israel has endowed the Jewish people with an unprecedented degree of power that is ill-served by a festering sense of resentment, an abiding angst over insecurity, a messianic zeal to right past wrongs. He wrote, to brood on our long history of impotence can only blunt our political judgment in an age when so much has changed and obscure the ideals of justice and righteousness that were the mark of the descendants of Abraham. All of this runs through my mind that Saturday night, four or five, six years ago, as I gazed at the array of plant-based delicacies just an order away, and I wonder if you know what it means to be a kosher, mostly vegan person looking at a menu where you can eat absolutely anything on the menu. 
So why, why do we do this? Why do we mark this time with fasting and sadness and lamentations? You know, I've been learning and listening to Rabbi B'nai Lappi over the course of my sabbatical. And you know that a teacher's a great teacher when you start to process the world through her voice, even when she's being quiet. And I can hear B'nai Lappi saying that Tisha B'Av matters because we have to grieve the destruction of Temple Judaism which was so tortured by its own zealotry, by its own narrowness, by sinat chinam, by hatred, because the death of that Judaism instigated the birth of our Judaism. It, it made way for the birth of this, a more inclusive, more radical, more affirming rabbinic Judaism. And I so deeply appreciate that read. We grieve the past so that we can move on from the past. But what I want to do is add three more, three more possible reasons why we might find meaning in this night and tomorrow. First, because as Rabbi Panitz was just about to say, this day, Tisha B'Av, has become associated not only with the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of our sacred temple, but with all of the sad and horrible and horrific things that our people have suffered throughout history, famines and wars and exiles, persecution and violence and genocide, as far back as the decree that the formerly enslaved Israelites would die in the wilderness before reaching the promised land, which we associate with the ninth of Av, to the defeat of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which we associate with the ninth of Av, to the Talmud being burned in public in 13th century in the Church of Paris, to the persecution and expulsion of the Jews of Spain, which was completed on the 9th of Av in 1492. What do we learn from all of this? The, the stacking of historical wrongs against our people on this day? We're saying to our ancestors in their suffering, you are not lost. I remember you. I honor you and your pain and your struggle and your anguish. Your suffering is part of my story. That is is an expression of love. Grief is an expression of love. Number two, we do this not just to learn about our past, but obviously to warn us about our present because there's this moral message in our suffering. This happened to us, we say, because of our failures, because of our zealotry, because of our senseless hatred. We don't blame the Roman legions. We blame ourselves. We look at ourselves and say, what could we, what must we do differently? We do that because we know that there will come a time again when we will be in the same position as we were, and we must not repeat the mistakes of the past. And I have to say that it doesn't take too much mental gymnastics to see how urgent that call is in our time, in this moment. And so this story and these rituals help us create a culture of self-reflection, a culture in which we demand of ourselves better answers. Wherever you are, pause. Are you platforming? Are you justifying? Are you excusing extremism? It didn't work out so well for our ancestors when they did. So what do we need to do differently? Are you allowing violence and cruelty and senseless hatred to flourish? It didn't work out for them. What can we do differently? Is our society a healthy civic environment? Are we taking care of each other's bodies and spirits and hearts? These are the stakes our tradition cries out to us. Change now before it's too late. So number one, we grieve because grief is an expression of love. We're not allowing our ancestors' deaths to be in vain. Number two, not to learn about the past, but to warn us today about the present. And let me offer one final possibility. There's only one other full fast day in our calendar year. Of course, it's Yom Kippur. God willing, we and many more people will be gathered here on Yom Kippur Day in just two months or less, a little bit less. That day is a very powerful collective experience but it's rooted in an individual self-reckoning. And here on Tisha B'Av, 
We root the day in the collectivity of our fate. We, a collective, are in this together. We have suffered, we have lost, we have been diminished and shamed and oppressed and overturned and pursued and genocided. We are part of a sacred collective. Our pain is part of a broad network of human suffering. We are not alone in the struggle and we will not be alone in the solution. Tisha B'Av puts forward this radical idea that there is no full spiritual life without a community of belonging without a sense of connectedness to others who are also suffering, who are also struggling, who are also surviving, and who sometimes are also thriving. As alone as we might feel in this world, in these times, we are tied to one another. And that is the message that I wanna invite us to hold on to most on this Shabbat, my first Shabbat back from sabbatical. In the course of my time away from all of you, I read many dystopian novels. I watched Severance and Hacks. I went to volleyball and interminable baseball games. I picked up groceries for my parents and I got to run over in the middle of the day just to give them hugs because I could. I'm gonna keep that practice. I have a hobby now. I have a hobby. I've never had a hobby in my whole life and undoubtedly you will hear many pottery sermons and illusions in the days ahead. And I traveled in California, and in Central Europe, and in Central America, and I immersed in God's creation, and I sat on the porch and learned Torah while a cloud from the cloud forest overtook our room, and we couldn't even see five feet in front of us. And I got lost on cobblestone streets of cities whose names I honestly didn't know before I arrived and would never have known if Sean and Susanna and Gosha hadn't made the itinerary. And and I wrote a lot. And I know you're going to hear a lot about that in the days ahead. But what I was really trying to do was capture and make sense of the Torah that I have learned from this beautiful community over the course of nearly two decades together. And and I want to say that now because the irony of my time away was that I really had to step to the margins, to the periphery of this community of belonging and shared purpose in order to be able to fully reflect on it and see it as the incredible, breathtaking beauty that it is. The greatest awareness that I came to in my aloneness is the essential nature of the bonds of togetherness that have formed over the course of pain and love and triumph for all of us over time. And every day when I would daven on my own and I would, I would come to the prayer for healing in the Amidah, I realized that I didn't know who was sick in our community and it kind of broke my heart, even though the sabbatical demanded that I didn't know everybody who was going through illness. And our team was so great at kind of protecting my space and not telling me everything that was going on. But I needed to know in my heart so that I could pray for you and with you. And so instead, I would just pause for a moment and I would say, Kola kihilak dosha, the whole our whole sacred community, all of the cholim, all of the sick among them too. This day, Tisha B'Av, it's not only about connecting with other Jewish people here or in Montreal or in wherever you're vacationing. It's about connecting to humanity. And no, I don't believe that that kind of universalizing diminishes our ties to our own Jewish community. It's precisely because of our deep and our profound connection to our Jewish community and to our shared tragedies that we feel so deeply connected to other people who suffer and struggle. And all of that is why four or five or six years ago, when we were seated at a beautiful vegan restaurant in Montreal, surrounded by strangers who didn't give a damn whether we ate or fasted, Silently, we rose and we walked back to our hotel and our stomachs were already growling and we basically put on sackcloth and ashes, which was just a simple dress and my sneakers. And we took a taxi to the conservative synagogue in Montreal where we sat down on the floor and heard the recitation of Echa of Lamentations because we knew and we understood that life is most meaningfully lived from within the fabric of community. A community sometimes of shared history, certainly a community of shared purpose, a community 
of human beings committed to learning the lessons of the past and together shaping a different kind of future. So I wish you Shabbat Shalom and hope that this is a Tisha B'Av of meaning and purpose that helps us remember exactly how important the work is that we do together. Shabbat Shalom. Amen.